I'm Melinda Crane, and I will be moderating this afternoon's session at the ITF 2012. If you just would come in, please, and take your seats, then we can get started. Do stay. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> Our topic today is from supply chain to supply stream, creating seamless logistics. And you know it, whether you're a shipper or a carrier, whether you buy, sell, or regulate logistical services, you have been seeing a fundamental transformation in international trade flows. A massive geographic dispersal in supply and in demand means that supply chains are more complex and more fragmented than ever. Meanwhile, profit margins are shrinking, shelf lives are compressing, and that means cost and time pressures are just steadily on the rise. All of these trends put a premium on flexibility and on optimization, and those two don't always correspond. Delays can reverberate throughout the entire chain. Transport infrastructure and services have to perform to increasingly high levels of reliability to meet shippers' demands. Hinterland connections and smooth intermodal coordination are central to port competitiveness and to overall efficiency. Governments recognize the strategic importance of effective supply chains to economic growth. APEC ministers, for example, have endorsed a 10% improvement in terms of time, cost, and reliability by 2015. Sounds good, but Who's going to make it happen? That's just one of the things we want to discuss here today. We'll be asking which cost-effective solutions best enhance the connectivity of supply chains and the reliability of transport. And who, governments, shippers, carriers, others, should be responsible for their implementation. Where is investment most important? in port capacity, in custom services, in data exchange, in hinterland connectivity? Does increased intermodal integration require greater internalization of transport services within single companies? And does that mean less choice for consumers? Do the biggest bar barriers to interoperability lie in technical standards or in institutional structures? All of those are questions that we hope to talk about, so we've got a lot on the table, but we've also got a great panel to address these issues, and we want to hear from you as well, ladies and gentlemen, so we will be opening the floor later on to questions. And now it gives me great pleasure to announce our panelists, and I will just ask them to take the stage, please, one by one as I introduce them. Starting out with Katarina Elmsetter Svert. She is Sweden's Minister for Infrastructure. She previously served in Parliament. She chaired the Committee on the Labour Market and also the Committee on Environment and Agriculture. Welcome to you. And we're very pleased that Dr. Oral Ederan is with us today. He's Professor of Finance at Istanbul's Bilgi University. He's also an advisor to Turkey's Minister of Transport, Shipping, Maritime Affairs and Communication, and to the Chairman of the Turkish Chamber of Shipping. Welcome to you. And we have with us as well Mr. Jeff Langenfeld. He is Vice President of International Logistics at Walmart formerly Vice President for Mobile Operations, Solutions Operations at Nokia. He has over 20 years of global supply chain management experience. Welcome. <laughs> and with us as well, Peter van Laarhoven is Director of Corporate Development for the Netherlands Schiphol Group with responsibility for the strategy and long-term development activities of the airport. He's also worked as Group Director of Strategy for TNT and as an advisor to the Dutch Ministry of Transportation. Glad you can be with us. And last but certainly not least, Ron Widows is the recently appointed CEO of Germany's Rickmers Holding and Rickmers Linie Shipping Group. He previously served as the NOL Group's President and Chief Executive Officer and as a member of the NOL Board. And Ron also chairs the World Shipping Council. So glad to see you again.
Just going to switch microphones here. Yes, it's on. Very good. Ron Widows, you have been in shipping for over 40 years. Where do you see the biggest changes and challenges now in terms of supply chain optimization? The, uh, the industry has, uh, has seen some dramatic change. So volatility, a uh, more volatile environment, you know, whether that's volatility of price. We've always had cycles in price. Now you have volatility uh, in terms of fuel price. Fuel uh, is fundamentally changing our industry. But the kinds of challenges uh, that the industry is, uh, is, is going through, a group arguably that doesn't do a very good job of change, <laughs> and is not coping real well uh, financially with the challenges. As a result, you have huge losses. And that stimulates behavior that's not helpful for supply chain. So you have a slowing of the assets at sea. Uh, that is something that's now, I think, understood to be a permanent feature, uh, at least until technology develops that won't, we won't see for a number of years. So in the middle of Jeff's supply chain, you have this big, ugly, not very reliable thing in the middle. And the pressures, uh, the complexities, uh, the things that exist in the world that the industry is struggling with, uh, they, they don't operate in a way that's helpful in terms of speed in the supply chain. So speed is now got to be thought about differently. Uh, there's different segments of the supply chain that there is maybe some things that can be done. Government certainly has uh, a role in that as well as others. We'll talk about that a little bit. But I think most significant is the slowing in the supply chain that's due to fuel cost and where people believe it to go uh, and what that's done to a whole asset class and the transformation that that will have, the effect that that will have on our industry. And that's fairly dramatic change. A whole asset class, meaning uh, putting a whole asset class already into the category of obsolete or? Well, it'll take a little time. Uh, ship owners, of which I am, uh, would uh, argue that the, the, the assets in place today will be needed for a while. But when you can bring assets, you can buy assets today. Uh, you've all seen the pictures of the big 14,000 TU container ship. The ships that are being delivered today, not only were they bought at significantly higher capital cost, 165, 170 million dollars a piece. You can buy the same ship today for 115, 120 million. That same ship burns 40 something percent less fuel at the same price. That translates to $50,000 a day less fuel consumption. That's good environmentally because the emissions are dramatically lower, but the cost implications of that are enormous. That brings about a shift to new ship design, which has taken place recently, and a whole new round of investment, the financing of which is not available. <laughs> so there's a lot of things going on that will change, but it will take a little time for that to take hold. And in the meantime, the industry, shipping in general, will do what they can to reduce costs, and that generally has to do with less speed. Since... Uh Ron mentioned you, Jeff. I think we'll just uh, toss that ball right on to you. He says you have a great big problem right in the middle of your supply chain. Do you see it that way? What are the main challenges that you are confronting and what strategies are you using to cope with them? Um, when we look at our supply chains um, outside of the United States, um, we, we approach them in such a way that we do not have any expectation that every supply chain that we run has to be world class. Our, our approach to business is that we just want to be the very best in the markets that we play. If we try to go about building um, huge complex supply chains where it's not necessary, to, whether we're talking about entering a market or whether we're talking about the markets that we're already in, um, our goal is to be the, the best among the competitors and try to stay one step ahead of them. And with that brings a considerable amount of complexity. Some of these markets we know a lot about. Some of them we're learning, uh, just like the rest of the, uh, the industry is, how to do business in these countries. And every country is different. There is there's not a, one single best way to approach the problems that we face in our international markets. When I talk about international markets, I'm talking about markets outside of the United States. 
the, the level of, of complexity that we have in the United States um, is much different than the level of complexity that we have, for example, in China. And, you know, Melinda, one of the questions you ask is, is you know, what are, what are the challenges? Right now, the single biggest challenge that, that our company faces in most of our international markets is all around the ability to be able to get reliable transportation. And most of it in, in that, you know, with a little bit of background is that what that really comes down to is, is the, the truck transportation. And this is transport between the, the suppliers or the manufacturers into our distribution network as well as from our network, uh, as well as the, the piece of the supply chain between the distribution centers and the stores. And, you know, Ron, Ron touched on it real briefly here, but the reality of it is, is because there is, there's not enough reliability or more importantly, predictability around the amount of time it takes to, to, to make deliveries into warehouses or into stores, uh, results in there being more inventory in the supply chains. And it's not just Walmart's supply chains. It's our suppliers' supply chains as well. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what is the most optimal way to flow product from the time we get uh, um, a signal from our customers that they're ready, that, that we need to do some type of a uh, replenishment to actually start the cycle of sending the demand signal to the supplier and as quickly and as predictably as possible get it to the store shelves. At the end of the day, we like fast, we like, we like the speed of the supply chain, but we spend the majority of our time working on trying to make it more predictable. We're going to come back to some of the issues around reliability and predictability and what elements might enhance them. But clearly, when we're looking at what can speed things up or at least make them smoother, there's also a role there for governments to play, Minister Emz Esviad. Where do you see the priorities for public sector investment, bearing in mind, of course, that many governments are very hard pressed to justify investment under present conditions? And what do you expect from other stakeholders? First of all, I think it's very important that all stakeholders together actually also work together. Uh, as the uh, government and the state has the responsibility for the infrastructure. Uh, if, for example, we take what Jeff was talking about, reliability, even though we are catching up with that later on. But if we have the challenge about climate, and mostly everyone are talking about the needs of transportation on railways. So railways can never compete enough if it's not reliable. Otherwise, you will have it on the roads. But then we have the maritime sector as well. In Sweden, for example, our focus right now is to make sure that the already existing infrastructure is reliable. Punctuality is the most important thing. Uh, that means before we build new expensive lines, we must make sure that the already existed infrastructure actually works as it was meant to be from the beginning. Uh, so that's one way. But we also have legislations, of course, uh, to make it uh, uh, with the same kinds of... Uh, uh, well, when you compete with different operators, they, it must be transparent between them, so we don't have uh, anything extra for the state-owned uh, railway company or whatever. So it must be transparent between. Because I think, in my mind, when I see chain and uh, stream, stream, stream it's, it's more, is it a system or is it service? And if I'm for example, working at Walmart. Uh, for me, it's like service to make sure that everything is out in the stores. Because people, when they go shopping, they don't ask why and how things get there. They just want them there. And it's the same thing with the people traveling. They don't matter who is operating. They want the service. So it's more like that. 
So you're suggesting to me that government regulation is important to ensure that that cooperation between different operators proceeds smoothly? It must. And that's also the, the big issue, as I mentioned before in the big hall, that you must be at the same time colleagues as well as competitors. They have this new word for this. It's not so new anymore, I guess. Coopetition. <laughs> Peter von Lahoven, the very essence of reliability, of course, is information, knowing when to expect that something's going to get there, knowing where it is. Key component of seamless logistics and a key component for the Netherlands. It's an area where you are putting a lot of emphasis, as I understand it. Tell us how you're working with other stakeholders in that realm. Um, well, thanks for that question. Um, Maybe uh, to start off, uh, uh, to provide you a little bit of context, um, the Dutch government uh, has recently decided to focus all its, its industry efforts and policy uh, on uh, um, nine so-called top sectors. And logistics and transportation is one of them. And uh, as a sector, we're of course very happy with that. Uh, that has not always been the case. Uh, and maybe it's not so surprising because, of course, the Netherlands is well known for uh, its, its role as a, as a hub in Europe. Uh, we have the largest port. Uh, we have a very big airport uh, where I work. Um, and as a result of that focus, uh, there are two, I think, two key initiatives which are both related to what you just mentioned. One is that we have a, a logistics top institute. Uh, they're actually organizing a site event here tomorrow where really academics and people from industry work on key issues and, and availability of information is clearly one of them. And the other one is uh, called the Strategic Platform Logistics, which is a kind of steering board for all logistics initiatives in the Netherlands. And there's representatives from industry, from academics, from the government, uh, from trade associations, member of that, uh, that steering board. I'm a member myself. And um, they have uh, proposed six major initiatives to push forward the, the sector in the Netherlands. And three of them are more or less related to supply chain connectivity and, and the availability of information. Probably the most important one is something called the Neutral Logistics Information Platform, which is a based on already existing port community systems. So systems we have, for example, at the airport and in the harbor to uh, have uh, seamless uh, connections between uh, customers and, and, and other users of the infrastructure. Um, and that's supposed to be a national system by 2020 where uh, data on supply chains is available to all, all parties participating. Um, that, that's one important initiative. Second one is called Syngro Modality. That's probably a word the Dutch uh, have introduced in the English language. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of uh, a modality. So it's, it's a concept where you don't know beforehand which modality you will use. And clearly information there is also very important. And, and thirdly is improving our already very good customs uh, service. Uh, as an airport, we are also uh, working on more local initiatives, so within the region, for example, uh, supported by the Amsterdam Economic Board. And, and most of these projects, we have about nine pilot projects running, are all focused on, on seamless connections and availability of data. Very good. Several points there we're going to want to pick up later, including customs. Um, let's stay right now, though, with the question of intermodality in the hinterland. Oral Erdogan, when we talk about complexity, uh, which we mentioned at the outset, which you also mentioned, Jeff Langenfeld, clearly it's a big challenge land side, hinterland connections. Many emerging markets like Turkey are countries with a very large land mass and immense dispersal now of production facilities. How are companies in Turkey dealing with the challenges? Thank you kindly, Melinda. Uh, this time I don't want to talk theoretically, so I will uh, try to find a real example and you help me. Kocaeli is the most industrialized city in Turkey and a fine example for this conference. As it has 13% of Turkish gross domestic product, 
and so 13 percent of Turkish tax income and also 17 percent of total foreign trade of Turkey. It is also home base to 95 of 1,000 biggest exporters and also 83 of 500 biggest firms in Turkey. And also this region has 34 ports in the same Gulf area. So we believed and asked the professionals in this region, uh, how can we solve the supply chain efficiency? And they answered our results and we grouped them in three parts. First of all, with respect to supply chain flow and reliability, firms are heavily focused on their own production facilities and they assume that lowering the production cost and also storage cost will enable them to enhance their connectivity. On the other hand, on the macro level, the reason for a bottleneck within the ports seems to be related with the customs operations and related progressive in short. Regarding the priorities for investment under current financial constraints, especially during these financial stress times, survey results implicitly suggest that custom services, ports, and connections of the firms, industry zones to the ports require serious infrastructure and refurbishments. Port systems should be specialized and integrated in line with a master plan and in compliance with characteristics of the industry in that land area. Finally, with respect to the role of actors in establishing cost efficiency, the respondents mainly see central government in the first place to carry out and coordinate the necessary investment projects. And it's also suggested that municipalities and also shipping firms should also take part in this project. Thank you very much. Ron Widows, shipping firms and governments, uh, how do you see the division of responsibility there? And do you, does that resonate with you, what you just heard? Uh, well, it does. And uh, I'll, I'll put the, the, the World Shipping Council hat on for a second. Uh, government's role, I mean, we, you, you see uh, regulation developing, uh, you know, if you're talking about a global supply chain. Uh, that because of the pressures within certain regions or certain countries, uh, those regulations, whether customs, security, uh, environmental regulations, uh, tend to develop uh, not in a, uh, uh, let's say, a harmonized way. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Unfortunately, supply chain operates across that. So where we see success is where government uh, has, uh, has been able to move in a more coordinated way. Uh, success in, in security and customs regime in the U.S., even though different parts of the U.S. may view differently. Uh, similar challenges uh, in the EU. The EU is a much more complicated process because of the different countries and how different countries uh, view that process. But if you're talking about the development of customs regulations that are helpful, uh, customs regulations that are helpful so that you can move through the system without having to comply with very different circumstance. Environmental regulations that are more or less the same. Emissions control areas, speed reduction areas, different. Frustration over carbon regime is understandable, but to the extent that those regulations develop differently for supporting a global chain, uh, that is inefficient, it causes problems in the supply chain, it increases cost, and that's a role where governments can take a very active role in understanding that some harmonization or alignment will help to improve the flow. We've seen some success, but still there's quite some challenge. Some countries where the customs regime is different within the country, <laughs> not just between countries, still. Minister, a lot of this forum is dedicated to the topic of seamlessness, to the idea of seamlessness, but cl clearly we're never going to get rid of all the seams. Borders are a seam. What can be done to deal with the kind of problems and bottlenecks and, and conflicts that Ron has just mentioned? That's a very tricky question because when this competition really starts to work, then you also start to look 
what will happen with my manufacturers, with my country, when the borders are open and we have this free market. And then it comes the economical situation. When it comes to the maritime issues, it's so very global, so it should be harmonized globally, but it's not. We're still struggling within the EU. Uh, and when it comes to the railways, that's something that we always are talking about, the seamlessness cr going uh, cross-border. But then we have different kinds of uh, uh, train uh, railway signaling that make its problems as soon as you go over to the next country. And we are talking about smooth corridors for freight and for goods, administrations that uh, hinders it to make it more smooth. But still we have to have this vision, otherwise it won't work. Uh, when we are planning like infrastructure in Sweden, it's a small country I know, uh, but we have lots of municipalities and regions and so on, everyone in each municipality they say I would like to have a new road here or new port here and they also want the government to pay for it of course. And then we say you must think in corridors, cross-border over municipalities, over regions, and even cross over your land border as well. That means you have to think for goods and freight in corridors. We have single skies when it comes to aviation. Exactly the same way are we struggling with in the European level, like for example the TNT network that was supposed to be trans-European network and for that you have subsidies from the EU but still there were things that was made that should be paid by naturally. So you have to raise the level, what is it for? Is it for better service, the seamlessness? But that will mean that you will also have to compete with your country, with other countries and that's what we say yes but as soon the economic situation will be worse, we just stop and say, no, 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 we must do it in our country. I'd like to get some input from the other panelists about where they see the biggest barriers to seamlessness, also in terms of intermodal interoperability. Starting with you, perhaps, uh, Mr. Uh, Lahoven, where do you think we can do better in that area and, and what are the big challenges? Um, I, I think it, it differs very much per country um, but if I look at, at a country like the Netherlands which is obviously well developed and uh, as I mentioned already the availability of, of data and, and actually knowing where uh, the stuff is and, and, and in order to, 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 to pass the, the, the borders between the different modalities is a big challenge which we're now picking up um, in, a, in a sort of co-production between industry, academics and the government. Uh, the, the, the challenge in the Netherlands is not so much the infrastructure itself. How about political challenges? From the viewpoint of many people here in Germany, you're actually uh, in intermodal heaven in many ways, at least in terms of coordination between rail and port. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, that's, uh, those are big words. Uh, um, actually, if you look at, at the different uh, um, the, 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 the customers we share, for example, as an airport with the harbor, there are not that many companies who uh, are both big in air transportation and in, in, in uh, sea transportation, for example. So that link in itself is, is between air and sea is actually not that important but we are lucky in the sense of having both a big harbor and a big uh, airport quite close to each other and they work uh, very well together. Jeff Langenfeld, for you, sourcing from many different vendors, very difficult challenges surely in terms of load optimization, in terms of timing. What kind of support are you looking for at the point of origin? What are, the, what are the difficulties that you face there? I mean, the, when it comes to uh, our supplier's ability 
to deliver what they promise us. Um, most of the time, they overpromise, which means that the transportation becomes the, the first step in the supply chain where we're trying to shrink the cycle time from when it ships until it arrives at, at the next uh, um, node or, the, or the, first, the next entry point into the supply chain. So one of the things that, that uh, we have done with, uh, with several of our larger shippers around the world is to work more closely with their supply chain organizations to help them understand how the decisions that they make impact what happens in that last uh, 50 kilometers before the product ever hits the store shelf. So, so one of the, the things that our company is working on is trying to make sure, especially, I mean, this, this form is a good example, where it's, it's important to hear what the customers actually value. And there are times that, uh, that, that this, is, as Ron was talking about, the, the big, big void between the supplier and, and the ultimate consumer, there's a big industry out there. And, and the, the challenge is to make sure that we're spending the right time and the right money in the right places. And it's one of the things that we're trying to do with, with, uh, with the supplier communities of, uh, around the world, especially in those markets that we're in today. Oral Erdogan, in the research that did, you did, did you find that the biggest barriers to interoperability uh, and coordination lay more in the technical or in the institutional realm? Um, thank you. Uh, I think it's a kind of easier said than done problem. Uh, both sides. The firm side, suppliers, and also the other side, the government sides, should be just in the solving of the, this problem. Uh, it's not actually either technical or maybe institutional, but also a kind of regulatory issue, I think, because, for instance, the municipality and the industry people and the suppliers should all uh, together should all be together in the same arena or platform to solve the issue. But everybody thinks of their own goals in the world. For instance, we are not discussing the China issue here. China is producing with the huge reserves by the U.S. Then uh, it is really difficult to talk everything to facilitate in our own country because the production cost is already maybe half, maybe one third of your production cost. So, first of all, we should also in uh, in, uh, we should also think about the others' aims. What China is doing now? Otherwise, uh, our solutions just for ourselves, but not for the world. I think. Thank you. What does that point to then for Turkey? Where where would that process of thought take you? Now uh, I can give uh, some numbers. Especially in 2003, the infrastructure investments in transport in the government budget was just 13 percent, sorry, uh, 17 percent. In 2008, it is doubled to 35 percent. With the rational investments, we did this. Even almost many countries are living the severe financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. Turkish Minister of Transport increased this share to 50% now. So we are all trying to increase the infrastructure investments of the government in transport issues. That is, I think, the solution, uh, possible solution for uh, your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to take uh, input from a member of the audience at this point. He's Mr. Manyo Singh, and he is the advisor to the Transport Planning Commission for the Government of India. And uh, if I can just uh, make sure that he gets a microphone. Very good. Um, as I understand it, your government, when we talk about uh, focusing and really channeling funds into this area, your government managed to greatly expedite port to hinterland connectivity by, as, as I say, uh, putting a great investment focus in that area. Tell us more about that, if you would. Uh, thank you, uh, Melinda, for this opportunity. Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to share India's e uh, experience in this, seg in this segment. Uh, essentially, if you um, sort of imagine India's map, it's, it's, um, it's a huge country and uh, it's a peninsula. So the ports of the country, I mean, it has a, uh, 
um, uh, you know, the port, uh, the, there are more than 200 ports, but the production centers of the country are mostly in the north, and the ports are in the south because it's, it's a peninsula. Um, so we have uh, this problem which you earlier mentioned of the hinterland connectivity. So between ports and hinterland, how exactly you, you improve the, the connection and the, and the logistics connectivity. Um, so we came up with this idea of the inland container depots or the uh, dry ports. Uh, essentially, dry ports replicate the facilities of the port inside the hinterland. Um, so, it, for example, our uh, biggest container port is, uh, is in the city of Mumbai, which is around 1,500 kilometers from Delhi, which is uh, the largest export base uh, for, for most of the commodities that we are exporting if through containers. Now, um, so we, we created uh, Asia's or probably world's uh, one of the largest dry ports uh, at Delhi. And uh, uh, this was done um, through, the, through uh, connecting the railways. Uh, and uh, uh, the railways, what it did was it, it had a separate focused organization. And uh, uh, with the help of this organization, we were able to penetrate inside the hinterland. For example, uh, let's take the case of Assam tea. Assam tea grows in the state of Assam, uh, which is a good 1,200 kilometers away from the nearest port of Calcutta. So between Calcutta port uh, and, uh, and this um, uh, Assam state, we had a dry port in the state of Assam, and from here we, we were able to connect. Now, with, uh, we uh, were able to make something, uh, as of now, as of today, we have 55 dry ports and 125 uh, container freight stations. Um, so it is, it is uh, possible, for example, to do all the customs facilitation, all the warehousing, all the other kinds of operations, which otherwise would have been done at the port and constrained the waterfront. So rather than constraining the waterfront, what we did was to move these activities right into the hinterland through the, uh, through the connection of the trains. And now we are investing into a dedicated freight corridor, which is um, nearly a $20 billion uh, project, uh, which will um, uh, basically, you know, this is a train, it is a rail line which is, uh, dedicating, uh, which is dedicated for the freight trains only. So the, the transit time between Mumbai, uh, Bombay, and Delhi would come down from nearly 40 hours to 15 hours, but this is going to take something like five more years to build. And once that is done, I think our hinterland penetration and connectivity would further improve. So I thought that I would uh, bring uh, this to, to the attention of the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, Ron, when we're looking at the need for increased intermodal integration, we heard the minister tell us uh, a, a moment ago that what we need is good regulation to ensure competition and smooth interaction between different operators. But is there possibly an argument that this could go in quite a different way and that what we actually need is more internalization of transport services within single companies? In other words, more integration. And if so, what will that mean for customers? Well, you have a couple. You know, it depends on where in the world. <laughs> um, and, and I'll, I'll mention something about India in a second, but uh, you know it's it's kind of gone the direction uh, intermodal trains, uh, rail in particular. Uh, consolidation in that space in the U.S. has basically resulted in two Western railroads. So there's not a lot of competition. Uh, in Europe, you have national governments involved in rail operations. Uh, the amount of competition and privatization in that space is not kind of conducive to the level of competition that you might see elsewhere. One of the things that India did uh, was they embraced privatization uh, significantly, a lot of private investment in port, in port infrastructure, but also in rail operations. So you have private sector folks who were providing rail transportation, many, in competition with the India Railway. Uh, and uh, that is, a, is an interesting dynamic. But intermodal connectivity specifically uh, the better job is done in linking that intermodal capability. The focus is very much on ports, has been, to get all of that volume out of the population center to minimize the environmental impact as well as the impact on the citizenry. But what doesn't get quite as much focus in many parts of the world is you have the same problem going into metropolitan areas. So you have traffic flow problems, 
because of intermodal networks that haven't developed into large metropolitan areas that over the next 10, 15 years, how are you going to get the things to the people when you don't have that infrastructure intermodally to get it efficiently into a population center without paralyzing the roads <laughs> uh, with goods movement. And uh, the, the, the conflict between goods movement and people movement is still an issue of some consequence and that's, that's a very tough problem for governments to grapple with. It doesn't matter what country, it's, it exists in, in most places. Minister, we do tend to assume that it's infrastructure providers and especially governments that should be responsible for enhancements. But is there possibly some low-hanging fruit here that might come from network users in terms of cost-effective improvements that could be made by them? Well, to start with, the situation nowadays is not longer that we uh, live, work, consume, or produce in the same small area, we have to travel for businesses, for studies, for work. And as uh, we mentioned before, the uh, competition of landmark, especially in the bigger cities, uh, bec between transportation and people actually living there are getting more and more uh, increased as well. And it's not that uh, we have this discussion about dry ports. That's a good situation for ports and using land, seaside, more beautiful areas, maybe for uh, housing and so on. But then we also have the situation with people changing their way of shopping. Maybe they don't go to the malls anymore. They shop by internet. That means that we have new services with new kinds of city logistics that we have to solve as well. That's why I do believe that several different stakeholders on different levels have to work together. Sometimes they compete, but mostly they are colleagues. We have, for example, in Sweden, two big clothing companies. One is well known as the H&M, and then we have Kapal. They are not competing when it comes to traveling or transportation, but when the goods are in the stores then they start to compete. Because we can't have two different trucks going in and out in the city with the same kind of goods. So in that, what I mean with good infrastructure, that means that something that we are responsible from the state level or municipality level, we have to also focus together on local, regional and national level. But then to include different stakeholders, operators, to make good service for personal traveling or for freights and goods. That's maybe what we should need regulations for. And when we deregulate, then we have regulate. Mr. Hoven, is there a lesson perhaps to be learned from the Netherlands experience in terms of government facilitation of stakeholder cooperation? As I understand it, in your logistics top institute, the main players are academia and industry, but there is government support for this effort. True. Um, and, and actually, I would say that the main players uh, are, are the industry players. Um, in the Netherlands, um, and I think that's uh, not, not just typical for the Netherlands, there is quite a, a gap between academic research and, um, and, and the industrial practice. And in this top institute, one of the ways we're trying to, to bridge that gap is by actually putting industry in the lead. So it's, it's not the agenda of the academics which determines the agenda of the top institute, but it's really uh, industry and the problems that industry is faced with that drive the agenda of this top institute, much more than the academic agenda. Um, and in that way, it's also been, well, I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's been feasible to, to get financial support from, uh, besides the, the, the government financial report, uh, support, also uh, significant support from industrial companies um, who are participating in these projects. I'd like to take that as a bridge to 
look into the question of information that we've raised several times and start out by taking another comment from the floor. Unfortunately, I don't know where Professor Lauri Oyala is sitting. There you are. Very nice to see you. Um, could we have a microphone for Mr. Oyala? Mr. Oyala is with the Turku School of Economics in Finland, and he has recently won DHL's Lifetime Award for the most innovative senior scientist for his work in initiating and co-authoring the Logistic Performance Index by the World Bank. What I'm interested in is whether stakeholders actually have enough information to make informed investment decisions, and in particular in regard to what are the costliest portions of their supply chains? Where do they need to be concentrating their efforts? How much information do they really have about that? Uh, well, thank you, Melinda. I hope the microphone is on uh, for the question. And uh, this is actually a follow-up of a one side event we had this morning that was actually entitled Measuring Logistics Performance, where we discussed various approaches to, to measure uh, qualitative per per performance indicators in logistics and supply chains, as well as logistics costs. And uh, both are relatively tricky issues to measure, often easier still to do on a company or a micro level than on a macro level. However, there are uh, efforts and, and ways to, to go about measuring both also at national level making those types of issues available also for policymakers. Um, it could be in terms of national level logistics surveys or studies uh, uh, focusing on those issues. And I think uh, what Peter, uh, uh, Peter van Laarhoven was mentioning, uh, it is an interesting approach that you have uh, taken in, uh, in the Netherlands that you sort of uh, bring the topics from the industry side and let the academic uh, community to figure out how to how to solve this. I think this type of interplay is very, very important, but it also takes the, the stakeholders from the public sector, governments in particular, to be active in uh, fostering that type of uh, data collection and, and studies. Methods do exist, and these should be used much more to have factual-based uh, decisions in the, in the future. Thank you. I'm wondering um, how much individual companies are going to be willing to participate open-ended in such a system, Jeff Langfeld. After all, this is very proprietary information we're talking about here, isn't it? Yeah, Laurie and I actually had a discussion about this over lunch today. I mean, th there are, uh, um, and I speak for more than just Walmart, and, and this, this audience realizes that in this industry, um, there are a set of base metrics that, all, that, that most leaders in the industry are tracking. And I think the, the idea is, is that if there is a way to be able to bring some level of standardization to a handful of the key metrics that drive business decisions, as well as those investments, there's probably less of a concern about the level of how proprietary this information really is. Um, you know, in, in most cases, um, these uh, when we're looking at our benchmark studies across the world, we're not trying to benchmark them in terms of, of are they all at the same price or the same cost or the same level of service. What we're trying to understand is what are the business drivers behind those metrics and making sure that we understand as those levers move what they do to our costs or what they do to the KPIs. And to me, I think that's where the time can be well spent and it's, and it's are really about spending less time worrying about the minutiae details and maybe the right thing to do is start at a higher level and focus on some of those K KPIs that really focus on where some of the issues are in the industry today. Mr. Erdogan, for you, uh, as an empiricist, you told us right at the beginning you didn't want to have a discussion in principle, you wanted to talk about facts and numbers. How difficult is it to get the kind of information that we're talking about? It's really difficult. Uh, as far as we uh, investigated via survey, uh, the transportation cost is almost between 6 and 15 percent of the production cost. But it's really difficult to measure the supply chain system's cost uh, in the total cost. As far as I remember, I said uh, the original production cost is the most important part. In any way, before thinking of supply chain part, you should try to decrease your own production cost. Otherwise, efficient transportation system helps China, not to other countries. That is my point. Thank you. Ron Witters, I know that you've, uh, in the past, 
while you were at NOL, done a great deal of work with shippers to look at their information needs mm -hmm. in terms of predictability, reliability, the kind of issues that we were talking about. What were the crucial elements for them of the kind of IT, comprehensive IT system that they were looking for? Yeah, it, uh, surprisingly, it varies quite a bit. I mean, uh, you have, you know, the people, uh, Walmart, Target, uh, IKEA. I mean, you have, uh, you have people at the more sophisticated end of the scale uh, who not only want very detailed data. When a piece of cargo came off, the, when did it get loaded? When is it in a box? When did it get on the ship? When did it get off the ship? It passed uh, North Platte, Idaho at 8 o'clock this morning. Uh, unfortunately, there's probably 80% of the population of shippers that still get their information by fax. <laughs> And so there's an information available, but the level of sophistication for taking that information and doing something with it to be helpful in terms of how you manage the flow, not quite there yet. Big opportunity, huge opportunity within the supplier shipper community. The more sophisticated people are, are beginning to look more deeply at upstream. So managing the raw materials movement. So the guy that ultimately builds the t-shirt is focusing more on cotton supply and the movement of cotton to the places where the yarn gets made to where the yarn finds its way to the factory where the shirt actually gets made that's way beyond where people were focused uh, not uh, not very long ago so managing a more significant piece of the supply chain and the information required to do that uh, but it does require a level of sophistication in terms of information technology uh, and then the capability within those companies to be able to do something with that. But I think that's kind of, that will develop over time and that will be helpful in allowing people to better manage their broader supply chain rather than just when they finally get that finished product into their hands to do something with it. Jeff Langenfeld, what are you looking for? Are you expecting carriers to essentially be IT companies? The, the requirements of being able to provide the level of information for large companies is absolutely critical and the investments have got to be made across the supply chain um, whether it's the, the, the shippers, the suppliers or, or the Anyone who's participating, any, any of the any of the sh stakeholders that are in the supply chain, need to realize that uh, with better information flow and um, more detailed level of information, the supply chain becomes smarter and it becomes more, um, more. It allows for the supply chain to be more dynamic because you're able to make decisions with a lot more pieces of information. So. You know, the expectation that we have of our suppliers or of our carrier, the, the carrier community is that uh, we give them information for a reason and, and, we, and we're looking for ways to work with the, the suppliers or the carriers to be more efficient and, and be able to speed up the, transa or the, you know, the transaction flows in order to be able to, to continue to get the product moved from the supply chain. So that sounds like, to some degrees, a fundamental shift in business models. I wonder um, if we can just have a summary round before we go to the floor for questions, whether you would agree that we're seeing that kind of paradigmatic shift and uh, maybe start with you, Mr. Lahoven, where that's going to take us. Um, well, I, I agree with uh, some of the points that were raised uh, uh, earlier that I think um, the efficiency gain is more in between companies than in companies themselves. So in, in uh, supply, making supply chains uh, more efficient across companies. Um, uh, whether that will be successful depends very much on whether companies indeed are willing to share their data. Uh, whether there is a neutral party who can, uh, can, can manage those data. Uh, whether it can be made clear where the profits are and whether companies see logistics as a competitive edge. Because if they do, then it's probably more difficult to realize uh, cooperation than if they don't. Minister, are we seeing 
a kind of a shifting paradigm here, perhaps from a sector that was based on freight flows to a more holistic approach that's based on logistics management and something like coopetition? Well, the right answer about that might be a Nobel Prize. But, but I think there will be a shift. Uh, when we look at the situation at home when it comes to the daily commuting uh, traveling system uh, and the needs for information, uh, the new technique with the smartphones and iPads and so on makes the passenger more informated than maybe the onboard service because they already know what's going on. So in some kind, good information from the uh, owner of the infrastructure when you have problems to the operators means that you can have better service. And everyone is competing ar around service. But for, for the passengers, it's good to have the right information. For example, if the train stops and you need to call in for some extra buses, it's good if the buses are there when the train stops and that you will have the information because that it's a satisfaction for the traveling passengers. But also when it comes to freight and goods, because you are always competing for the reliability of time, costs and function. And in some way you have a trust put in a contract and you need to know the information if there is an, a delay or something like that, what to do instead. But there is also the situation, the one with the best information will also make the best profit. And when we are talking about business, it's about the best information and it can't be the same the whole way out. But standard, what's come out for the best for the customers, to be satisfied. I think that's important. Professor Erdogan, a main message coming out of this panel, cooperation and coordination, extremely important. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I agree. And also I should add one more point, maybe missing point. Uh, if we would like to make a system more efficient, we don't forget the effect of the financial institutions. If we would like to increase the efficiency in the informative part, we should inform the banks as soon as possible after the commercial knowledge. Otherwise, uh, I don't believe that the system can solve the problem uh, solution uh, by itself. Uh, for instance, on the one hand, the firms are buying these products uh, from other firms, and then they, they have some difficulties to pay related checks. So it, ha it really destroys the system, especially in terms of supply chain efficiency. So not only the uh, industrial people or the firms, but also the whole stakeholders of the system, including the governments, should, be, should take part in the solution, I think. And also I should add one more thing. Uh, the competition is not just between the producers. Now the states are just uh, in the game, so we should be careful for the state's stimulus programs, especially in the Asia. Because, uh, as I again remind you, uh, the original cost of the product uh, affects the system. So uh, for the competition, especially in the OECD and World Tra Trade Organization, we should find a fair competition rule, uh, first of all, I think. Thank you. Jeff Langenfeld, uh, when you sum up for us, if you would please, just a brief word about decarbonization because it's something we've really scarcely touched on here and yet I know it is a major priority for Walmart. How does that fit into this whole seamless stream? I mean, for, for, for a company that is focused, I mean, all the way up to the executive level of our company on, on green, um, this piece of, of what it means in the supply chain is part of our vernacular. It's part of our ways of working, and will continue to be um, a focus as, as we can as we continue to move forward. And it's and we're we're mature and we're becoming more mature. 
And you know, as, as we think about the decisions that uh, that we make and what the impact on the on the planet is, to, to the planet is, um, let's say 10 years ago, it was never even part of the discussion. And today, um, in the in the conversations that we're having at all levels of, of our company um, with all stakeholders. It is, a, it is a topic of discussion and one that we'll continue to, to, to strive on and make sure that we're um, at least understanding how the decisions that we make, what they're doing to the environment, and if there's ways to, um, to make the right decision uh, for the company or for the consumer, because at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the consumers, and we're trying to do the very best that we can for them to give them the best best product at the best cost. Ron Widows, you told us at the outset that carriers are not always uh, the most change amenable uh, entities. And of course, we all know the metaphor about trying to turn around a big steamer. Um, how would you sum up where we need to be heading and what the role is for carriers as they look to the future? I think we've reached a point where, you know, the people who kind of had the view that uh, these things too shall pass and the world will go back to the way that it was, everything will be right in the world, uh, no worries, uh, have kind of now realized the world's changed. And as a result of that, uh, you've got uh, industry, shipping in particular, uh, that has become proactive in a move to address environmental uh, agenda to improve the conditions that we affect, uh, air and water quality, uh, and some coalescence around that. We need help from government. The broader political issues become a challenge, and those of you in the room uh, connected with government uh, know, uh, know how difficult that is with different parts of the world that are not simil similarly situated. Uh, to Jeff's point, you know, we see more shippers who are beginning to focus on uh, the environmental impact uh, of, uh, of their supply chain, but it's early days still. There's still a vast majority uh, that, well, they talk about it, but it's, it's not high on the list of price first, maybe speed, maybe reliability. Uh, environmental hasn't worked its way quite, uh, quite up the chain. Um, but I think the, the, the focus of people in the industry, whether it's shippers or on the service provider side, uh, now pretty much recognize things have changed. Uh, it's early days to say that there's a paradigm shift. I think we're not quite there yet. Uh, but coming to grips with the fact that the, the way things are done, the speed with which it moves, uh, the impact with which it has is very different, a relatively short period of time, uh, and the opportunities are there to bring about some improvement, uh, both in terms of cost, uh, as well as the, uh, the impact uh, that an entire industry has environmentally, but that's early days. Thank you very much. We would very much like to hear from you in the audience now, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we have some, yes, here I have in the front row. Front row, do I have a microphone? Thank you. Do tell us who you are and um, if you could tell us who your question is. This is uh, Yildirim, Minister of Transport and Communication of Turkey. I just carefully listened to all panelists. It's not a question really, it's a, a small contribution to the discussion. Well, it is seamlessness is a magic word. It is, it is good for everyone, but uh, in practical life is not possible because the, the thinking of transport and logistic is a trade. If we continue to think this is a trade, it doesn't work to uh, supply stream or uh, supply chain and whatsoever. So trade is a mean of increasing transport. So first we have to consider this is the fact. And then all governments, bilateral level or multilateral level, we have come together and to set uniform rules and regulation, border crossing or uh, other road 
rules and regulation uh, across the borders. So otherwise, you can organize good uh, supply chain or uh, supply stream within your country. That, that, that is possible. But it doesn't help too much to increase the worldwide trade and relation among the countries. So the first, the transport is not a trade itself. The transport is a mean of increasing trade among the countries. First, the, the rule is this. Afterwards, whether you are in government body or shippers or suppliers or uh, the consumers, whatever, then everything can be easily regulated and you can achieve uniform, smooth, uh, uh, seamless transport uh, system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any comments here on the panel before I take another question? Here we have in, uh, okay, take this one and then that one. I have a question to uh, um, Mr. Langenfeld. Will you Do tell you us who you are? Sorry? Tell us who you are, please. Okay, my name is Dietmar Winkler, and I'm editor at Verkehrsrundschau, which is a magazine on transport and logistics. And I uh, would like to ask uh, Mr. Langenfeld, do you measure your own uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, at Walmart, and do you ask your logistics provider to deliver you those Data and how important will this be for logistics provider to be able to deliver those uh, data? Yeah, so about five years ago, um, when the former CEO um, um, really started the, the, the green initiative, we set expectations with all of our suppliers, uh, whether they were manufacturers or whether they were third party logistics companies or service providers, um, and gave them. Um, a set of expectations about what we expect them to report, um, as well as the fact that we do that internally because, uh, as, as you know, we have um, in several countries, and including in the United States, we have our own private fleet, which we report um, the, uh, uh, the emission savings uh, annually um, for what we put into the atmosphere each year. One here and then one there. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Haupt from PTV, an IT company in transportation optimization. Um, I like the idea of cooperation in transportation, but it's very difficult because any planning needs data. And when it comes to the issue of data in the transport, industry, we have a lack of data and the aggregation of data, getting origin and destinations for freight flows, it's very complicated. So we could have consolidation of flows, but then we need cooperation and the data to optimize. There's a lot of space to optimize, but without data, no optimization. Thank you very much. That reinforces the message we heard from several panelists up here. Please. Uh, yes, I'm Jim Motivalli. I'm with uh, National Public Radio in the United States. Um, I have a question following up on what Mr. Langenfeld had said about Walmart challenging its suppliers. I believe specifically uh, some of the challenges were 200 suppliers were supposed to reduce their energy intensity by like 23 percent, and um, you were supposed to get to zero product defects so you wouldn't have the whole uh, return the product and the customer has to bring it back and then has to go to the depot and that itself brings a lot of supply chain movement there. I was wondering, since you, you challenged your suppliers like in China, it was in 2008, I was wondering how much progress they'd made towards those goals and I also wanted to ask the other panelists if they have also challenged their suppliers and how much progress they have made in getting their suppliers to uh, be more 
or maybe reduce their carbon footprints would be the best way of putting it. I guess that goes to you first, Jeff. Sorry, you want to ask a question first to the questioner? Oh, okay, we'll add your question to... Uh, my, my, my question is just next, next to me. Uh, I'm really uh, wondering why Walmart doesn't enter Turkish market. Is the reason, is the reason related with the supply chain or not? Thank you. We don't have enough time today to talk about the answer to that one. Um, but but, but just, just a quick, uh, quick follow-up uh, comment. Um, the, the, the fact that, that our suppliers, uh, we, we set expectations with our suppliers, we felt it was the right thing to do for our customers. And everybody in this room is a customer. And that's how Walmart uh, looks at it. So when, when we set these expectations with these suppliers, um, Several of them, the, the large multinational companies, jumped on board um, and have played a significant role in, in making progress um, with specific actions around the reduction of, uh, of, of the footprints that they, um, that they leave behind. And we're doing it ourselves in all of our stores also. So, you know, I, I'm not sure I, I can I can refute any of your uh, your statistics that you were citing there, but but progress is being made with our with the suppliers. And um, most of that information is, is available uh, yearly in our, in our uh, 10Ks that we file with the SEC in terms of where the savings are coming from. Yeah, we, um, as an airport, we have a, a control guide and influence program. And we distinguish between our own activities where we have the ambition to be CO2 neutral this year, and that's really under our control. And then guide and influence is very much uh, directed not so much to our suppliers but our stakeholders, which is not just uh, suppliers but it's also companies that are based on the airport. We have more than 500 companies and more than 60,000 people working at the airport, the municipalities around the airport, and we all try to make them more aware of uh, the issues in this area and, and guide in and influence them towards uh, CO2 not neutrality rather than try to control it. Minister, what do you see as the role of government here? What do they need to be doing to try to get that information out of... What, what can governments do to facilitate the process of getting out information on issues relating to carbon re reduction? Okay, I'm not really sure if I follow your question, but we have goals that are set by the government for the nation in total. For example, uh, renewable energies and so on, and that means that all different stakeholders work together to reach that goal. We have uh, a goal for a fossil free uh, fleet when it comes to cars and buses and trains and uh, aviation and everything by 2030. That's even tougher than the EU standards. Um, so we, we set up the goals, but then we have to work together and see can we use like carrots or um, force it, <laughs> whip it out, <laughs> or um, uh, you can earn money or so. We, we have to try to get some different. Um, ways to make sure that you are really into this because we can't by legislation make this happen. Questions? Here in the... Yeah. Thank you. My name is Catherine Ross and I direct the Center for Transportation System and Management at Georgia Institute of Technology and Center for Regional Growth. And, and my question is I'd like for you all to think for a moment about uh, the role of warehousing and what we're seeing relative to, to trends in warehousing with expanding emissions footprints and suburbanization and distancing between uh, warehousing and its customers. What is the role of warehousing in terms of helping us accomplish this seamless transport? Do we become so efficient between intermodal connectivity that it just goes away and, and everything gets delivered from one mode to the other or how do you think uh, we might be looking at its role in the future? Anybody like to jump in there before we give it to <laughs> Jeff? 
<laughs> Je Jeff knows more about warehouses uh, in general than I, but um, you know, in some supply chains, it's about not going into the warehouse at all. <laughs> So it's about uh, bypassing the warehouse. It's about uh, going direct to the store, uh, to the customer. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's evolved. I mean, again, uh, it's, it's information. So the ability to plan that from origin, wherever that origin might be, to be able to manage the flow so that it doesn't have to go to a place in the warehouse uh, is, uh, is part of that. If it does have to go uh, in... You know, the, the means by which people think about how they design their distribution centers and where they are and how that is relative to where the customer that they're serving is. Uh, different by, uh, by, uh, by company, uh, for sure, but it's largely around information and the ability to identify, either at origin or in the flow, to be able to have a more efficient flow around or through the warehouse. There's been some very interesting work done uh, in that area. Still, there's a lot of companies, they just blow it into a, a, a DC. Boom. It goes in, they sort it out there. Probably not real efficient, not environmentally efficient. Uh, so, again, an area that has quite some opportunity in general. I mean, just, just to add to, to Ron's point, um, the warehouses uh, play a critical role in any supply chain, especially those supply chains built for retail. Um, how the product goes through those buildings is, um, is, is relatively based on um, what the consumers are buying and the channels that we use to get product to the store shelves. So for example, um, Christmas trees, right? Christmas trees are not sitting in our warehouses today. Um, the channel that we use to put these artificial Christmas trees in the, in the consumers' homes in the United States is much different than how we uh, use those warehouses to, um, to replenish laundry soap. So the role of the warehouse is probably expanding the size, the number, the locations. You know, that's really, that's a math problem. And uh, to Ron's point, uh, that, that's data-driven. But when it comes to the, the, the piece around seamless, it's making sure that you have multiple channels. How you use those channels, whether they go through, around, or into a distribution center is where the, uh, or sort of where the science meets the, uh, the art. That was very poetic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, more questions? Are you all starting to think about the reception, perhaps? <laughs> No more? Then we will wind it up there. I'm not missing anybody over here? No? Okay. Then we'll wind it up right there and just say thank you very, very much to all of our panelists for a really interesting and wide-ranging discussion. And thanks to all of you as well for your attention and for your questions. And, um, yeah, enjoy your evening. <laughs>